this is a topic, neuromorphic algorithms and hardware for real-time real-world robots. That's what we usually do. I know that the title was announced much shorter in uh, the program, but that's the idea. We want to build algorithms and hardware for real-time real-world systems. Um, it's work done uh, largely in my uh, former group at TU Munich, where you see there were a lot of students and postdocs that have worked very hard to get all this work done. And right now I'm in the process of setting up a new group in Stockholm, where I have two students that you will meet later in the tutorials when you get your hands on, uh, I can't say on real robots because it's all virtual, but you have simulated real robots that you can train, that you can configure to do interesting tasks about neural computation. Uh, the next slide that I will show you've seen before, I've talked about this in the very uh, introduction to today's session. So you remember brains on the left side are very different to how processors in machines work nowadays. Um, and now I want to make use of that. I've given you a, a small spoiler of uh, interesting animals with very few neurons. So if you look at the very bottom left, there is an animal called the sponge. The sponge has very few neurons, about you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 neurons. And it uses these neurons to happily swim in the ocean to hunt for food, for, for like little plankton, little bacteria, little things that it can find in water to follow them and digest and eat them. But at some point in its life, the sponge decides to attach itself to a rock and stay at that rock and never let go. So it will never go away from that rock anymore. Once at the rock, the first thing it does after is eat up its own brain. So the sponge digests its own neurons. Now, that's a very clever thing to do, because when the sponge, the animal eats up its neuron, that's, that generates, that provides a lot of nutrition. It's, it's, it's rich energy that the sponge can reuse. That's also a pretty stupid thing to do, because when you eat up your own brain, then what do you do? Yeah, you don't have a brain anymore. So what you do is what I just said, the sponge stays there and becomes a passive animal. So it stays at the, at, the, at the rock for the rest of its life and it waits for food to swim through its own body so that it can digest whatever happens to come by. So the sponge really turns from an active animal into a passive animal. And that's a pretty clear indication that brains really have evolved to perform motor output to take sensory input and generate motor output as a computing system. It's not the primary, uh, it's not the primary purpose of a brain to, to perform object segmentation or to perform you know, visual scene understanding. It's not the primary uh, uh, importance of a brain to learn sequences of numbers. It's really to behave in a world to produce motor output so that you can survive and handle the world around you as effectively, as good as possible. So that's why in my group, we are very interested in such closed loop systems where we build you know, computers, where we build robots, technical systems that sense and produce motor output. So here's an overview of the topics of research that we look into, such as event-based neuromorphic vision. I will talk about that very briefly today. We talk about, we, we, we uh, do research in information processing and distributed neural circuits because neural networks are inherently distributed. I won't have time for that today. We look into neuromorphic real-time computing and control. I will spend a lot of time talking about that today because that's what the tutorial is also about. How do we get such neural systems operating in real time so that they can control a robotic output? And there has been a recent activity about self-construction and self-organization in neural circuits, again, where I can't talk about today. There are a lot of robots shown on this slide. Um, there are plenty more robots available in the lab. And there are plenty more robots that uh, you can see uh, when you come by. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, there will also be more robots in, in, the, in the talk today, um, but there's only so much we can do um, about the different systems. So, here is the next slide. This is about event-based vision. So I'll start with that because I really don't want to miss this opportunity to introduce you at least briefly to event-based vision. It's a vision sensor that works very differently to traditional cameras, but very much like the eye in our head does. 
So in our eyes, we have rods and cones, we have photosensitive elements that upon change in the environment produce a spike, an event, a message that encodes, that says there is a change in that pixel. So when that pixel is looking forward, when that pixel, when, when that one, one sensing element is looking at some field of view in the world, then if something is brightening up or darkening in that part of the world, the pixel sends a message so that we have that information available as a spike saying now it's brighter. You can see at the bottom left, you see a video reconstruction. There's one side, my hand moving up and down, recorded with a traditional video camera. There is on the other side, an event camera reconstruction where my hand is the same scene recorded by an event camera where you see green and red dots lighting up exactly at those places where my hand enters the field of view of a pixel or leaves the field of view of a pixel. So we have this, this stream of events shown in a different plot on the right side where you have continuous time and you have an X and Y pixel plane and you're getting dots which show uh, on or off events for changes towards bright or dark. On the video, you see a reconstruction so that we humans understand what's going on. In the real data, you have significant advantages over uh, a traditional camera which is the advantages are listed here that you have very sparse, you have a relatively sparse data stream. That means for the same time of recording, there are fewer kilobytes, there's fewer information transmitted. And therefore we need a smaller computing system that can operate on this data. The second big advantage is that these cameras have very low response times. So every single pixel will respond immediately within a few microseconds delay when there is a change of brightness. Normal cameras have an exposure time and they provide let's say 20 frames, 50 frames, 100 frames per second. But that means you have delays of, of several milliseconds at least. And the third obvious advantage is the local contrast adjustment per pixel. So every single pixel will be sensitive with respect to its current brightness. So if you have a camera that's looking through sunglasses, you get the exact same signal because the pixel is relative, the pixel sensitivity is relative to its lightness. If you have a camera that looks halfway into a tunnel and halfway outside, you're getting uh, qualitatively good signals on the outside of the tunnel and on the inside at the same time, because again, each pixel is relative to its local environment. So that's sensor chips that have been developed by a research group in Zurich about a decade, 12 years ago, um, inspired by how the human eye works and they provide information spikes very similar to the way that the brain uses information to come in and to represent a visual scene. So we, we are so used to cameras that we think we have cameras in our heads, but we have very different, we have a very different sensing system and therefore, we also need a very different computing system, the brain afterwards. Now, here's just a, a reminder of this is what it looks like when we do a video reconstruction. But really, the data format, as shown on the right, is just a sequence of information, of pieces of information that encode where an event happened, where it got, where in the image plane it got brighter or darker. These are available cameras that you can buy uh, from different uh, vendors. They all come with a USB cable that you plug into your computer, and then you can use the camera and build your own algorithms, use your own software, do your image processing, put your intelligence there. What we do in my lab largely is build embedded systems so that we combine microcontrollers or processors or neuromorphic processors closely to the sensor chip and then have onboard processing systems. So we can run neural networks or traditional computer vision algorithms on board of these chips next to the cameras or even integrated in very, very small packages. And then we put these cameras on mobile systems. So here, for example, on the top left, you see a small robot that uh, drives based on the camera signal. So you have event camera data coming in and these robots are then programmed to follow 
other robots. So it's a chain of robots. Here on the top right, we've built a pencil balancing robot. So it's a little cart, a little uh, table that can move you know, left, right, front, back with two motors. And we can put a pen up on that table and have these special cameras observe the pen. And whenever the pen moves, we get signals, we get events within a few microseconds and can respond to the changes in time. The bottom, there's a tracking uh, of a chaotic pendulum of a very fast system. The bottom right, there is a, a robotic head that has two such cameras uh, on board to do uh, its cards, to follow uh, human motion patterns. You've heard about um, the saliency map, uh, that was presented by Rainer Goebel in the first talk. So here is a robotic head that can act as a real human to follow uh, interesting patterns in the scene. And that provides this, uh, the same type of input signal that the human eye would provide to a brain. Now, these are all fun projects. Here's a more serious, let's say commercial product. Here's a mobile, a small mobile robot that has one such camera uh, looking upright at a ceiling. And as soon as this robot moves, we're getting events, we're getting information of changes of the environment. And with this information of changes, we can build a map and localize the robot on a map. And I'll show you how this works in the next slide. So basically, here's a robot at the bottom driving around in an environment. That camera is looking up at a ceiling. There's some structure on the ceiling. And with every new incoming event, we have an algorithm that does two things. One is it uses this event to update its own belief of where it is in the world. And simultaneously, we use that new event to update the robot's knowledge about the uh, map on the ceiling, so about the pattern that it can observe on the ceiling. You see that on the bottom right, there is the path of the robot shown in red. That's how this robot assesses how it has driven in its environment. And in gray shades underneath, you see the reconstructed pattern on the ceiling that this robot has observed. So this allows a robot to move around in its own environment while it is knowing, while it can understand how it's moving in this environment. Now, there are commercial solutions available. You can buy such a system with a regular RGB, with a regular color camera, CMOS camera that you can put on your robot, but they come with many different disadvantages. One is it's very expensive in terms of computation to process regular camera images. Here we have a super simple algorithm that works on single events that um, create the map and find the robot's position. Adva disadvantage number two with regular cameras is privacy. Many people are concerned about having a robot drive around with a full camera in their apartment. So if you buy a robot vacuum cleaner, you probably don't want that camera to be active all the time to run around in your home. So here we only have these events and it's much harder to reconstruct any useful information and any, um, any uh, uh, compromising information from these events. You get information about structure in the room, but you cannot identify, for example, which person was there as easily as with an event camera. Finally, the whole processing is so much simpler that it can all be done on board. So we only need a microcontroller uh, on board that can generate this map. It's a much cheaper system. So the punchline here is that we can provide a technological system that does self-localization and mapping in a very cheap computing environment, in a cheap computing system with a very simple and very elegant algorithm because we found a sensory input that allows to do that, not a regular camera. And how did we find the sensory input? By looking at how the brain does it. How, has, how does the eye and the brain together communicate, work and communicate so that we humans can understand how uh, the world works around us? Here's another simple example. We've worked on a project to help visually impaired or even blind people to understand their local surrounding. Mm -hmm. So we have built a setup, a, a wearable setup. There's a prototype on the bottom right with a stereo camera setup. So we have two of these event cameras inside the white bar. And with these two cameras, we can do stereo fusion of incoming events, just as our visual cortex does stereo perception. And we can identify, we can find distances to objects in a, in a 
completely passive system. So many people can wear it simultaneously. Again, it's not a real camera. So people are not scared about privacy issues when, when someone wears this uh, in public or in private places. Um, it's a very low power, low energy system because the camera information is sparse compared to um, traditional cameras. So we can run this for many hours on a low battery time, on lo low computing time on batteries. Here's a, a demo video that shows how this works. So we have these two input streams. There's a left event stream and a right event stream. We can merge these two streams together and find matching events from left and right camera and show that as one stream where the color encodes distance to objects. So if I'm walking close towards a nearby object, I can get a warning uh, as a sound signal or, or as a 3D sound landscape produced so that uh, a human uh, that, who is visually impaired can be guided in the environment. So we can use this technology to help people to live uh, a more comfortable life. But the algorithm in here for stereo matching that is again inspired by how, the, how we believe the brain does um, stereo matching, that is computationally very inefficient. So basically for any incoming event from one camera, for example, the left camera, we try to match this event with a number of possible candidates from the incoming event stream from the right camera. And this matching happens in a matrix where uh, the scales uh, quadratically with a number of, of possible pixels. That is very hard to compute in a traditional microcontroller because you have to iterate a traditional computer. You have to iterate over all the possible matches and evaluate every possible match one after the other. In a neural system where you have potentially you know, hundreds of thousands of neurons just for this task, because you remember we have 100 billion neurons in the brain, so you can dedicate several hundreds of thousands of neurons just for stereo matching. So if you have several hundreds of thousands of neurons that work in parallel, then the stereo matching problem can be worked on in parallel. So it's a significantly faster process for every single incoming event. And that concludes the first part of my talk where, where I've given you an, an outlook over uh, event-based vision and how these event cameras work and how they are beneficial and how they're inspired by human vision. And now this shows the need for a different form of computation. So we cannot run all the algorithms, all the, all the ideas from brain-inspired computing, we cannot run them effectively on traditional hardware. Of course, we can run a neural network, any neural algorithm on any normal computer. The, the computer I have on my desk, the computer I'm talking to right now is Turing complete, so it can run any algorithm I want. It is just very, very inefficient. And that's why you've probably heard training neural networks, training these systems takes a lot of time. It's a very inefficient process that can be speeded up, sped up by GPU cards to some extent, but overall, this traditional computing architecture, we call it von Neumann architecture based on its designer, it's fundamentally different to how neural networks compute. And that is what I want to address in the second half of this talk, at least a bit about neuromorphic real-time computing and control. So here you see an instance of a robot that is doing neuromorphic uh, computing, and uh, solves a task with a neural computing program, with a neural brain. So here we have a very simple task, which is that we have these five poles that are blinking with light at different frequencies. And the frequencies are supposed to be an increasing order. Right now, they are not. So we can't tell as humans, we don't see that, but I can tell you that these have different blinking frequencies. And um, the robot should sort them so that the lowest frequency is on its left side and the highest blinking frequency is on the bottom side. Now, as an engineer, I can, of course, program this in, but it's a pretty tricky process. I need to uh, find out a lot of, uh, I need to understand the environment. I need to program a lot of what to do, how to sense, how to interpret. I also need to um, understand um, 
I need to understand how to make the robot move with its wheels and with a robotic arm so that it aligns to grasp the object. Here in contrast, we have used a neural network, a pretty big neural network, and we've shown the neural network good examples and bad examples. And we've driven the robot by hand to drive to a place and to pick up an object. And then after several training sessions, this robot and this neural network together with the robot has learned how to generalize and how to do this task by itself. So it has spent some minutes execution. And now from its own perspective, from its own cameras, the uh, five poles are perfectly in sequence so that the lowest frequency is on its left and the highest frequency is on its right. So the fundamental difference here is that we have not spent energy and money on a very clever engineer who programs what the robot has to do and any circumstance that could arise and how the robot can handle it. But instead, we have spent time and energy and money to set up a neural network. And then we've given demonstrations to this robot. We've given the, the lights, the poles that blink in different configurations in right and wrong settings. And we've shown it, we, we've labeled what is a right and what is a wrong configuration. And then we've used a person with a joystick, with a you know, game pad to drive the robot and to move the robot arm and to show the network what can be done. And after several such training sessions, this robot has learned what it should do, what should be the desired goal configuration, and how it can then act and move the wheels and the robotic arm to execute that, so to change its environment into the right configuration. So these neural networks can do a lot of pretty amazing things once they are set up correctly so that they can perceive sensory input and can generate motor output. In this project, we have used learning. We've used online and offline learning. We've done some training. It's been a pretty long project. Um, this is nothing that we can do in one afternoon, but you will do something similar in the tutorials after today's talk so that you configure your networks so that your robots do something meaningful. In a more complex real world setting, such as this one, we are running into problems, which is that when you execute such networks, they have to run in real time. They can only use up so much energy. They can only uh, run so big a network on available computing resources. So we have to wonder about how we can instantiate um, neural networks. So I'll talk about how we can run and compute neural networks efficiently. Before that, I've seen there was a question on von Neumann computing architecture versus neural networks um, and this modern neuromorphic computing. Julia has already addressed that in her answers. I've sneaked in a slide so that I can talk a bit more about that here as well. So the von Neumann computing architecture, the traditional computer setting that we use on, on all the desktop computers nowadays is that you essentially have a very big processing unit. This could be two or four or eight, it could be an eight core but it's not hundreds of thousands of processors that you have in your computer. So you have a very powerful processing unit. Then you have very efficient memory somewhere so that you can store and retrieve numbers. It's called SRAM into your computer. So, so you can have you know, several gigabytes where this processor in light blue stores data or retrieves data from the memory. And that's what's needed to run your algorithm. So if you, if you get new camera vision input, you need to store the image and you need to look at patches of the image. You need to fetch some data from your memory where you say, oh, I remember what uh, uh, an object looks like. So you have to access that memory all the time, which creates a bottleneck in the purple bar, which is the access route between computer and memory. Now in neuromorphic computing systems, the setup looks a little different where you have a very large number of small computing units. So here we've shown nine, but in principle you have 10,000, 100,000 millions of independent small computing units, each with its own local memory. So that each local computing unit can look up information locally very efficiently 
and also has some way of exchanging information. This means that one of these um, units could send information to a different memory location, or it could communicate with a different processor somewhere. It could send a message to some other computer. So you have a fundamentally different computing system where the computing is distributed across um, the, the, the silicon substrate, the available chip surface. We have separate small computers, which are not as powerful as the, the big one on the left. And they only have fast access to a small amount of memory. That's what Julia mentioned earlier when she said there is intertwined processing and memory. So the memory is at the computing side. So you can think of the blue box here as one neuron and that one neuron has local weights as input values and it has a local membrane potential and it has local thresholds and so on. So it has immediate access and, and information to its own parameters, but it cannot access everything else easily. So there's high parallelism. There is a technical protocol needed to exchange information between these computing units. There's no need to go into detail, but let's assume they communicate with spikes, then we need to find a physical representation of the spikes, which is typically used as an address event representation where we send information through a bus and use uh, spikes at certain times from certain senders and reconstruct the spike train uh, to, to receivers again. So that's the uh, technical detail of how to implement communication. Such a system, the neuromorphic architecture uses, typically uses significantly less power because each of the small computing units runs at a reduced clock frequency. And that's perfectly fast enough for neuromorphic algorithms, um, but it saves a lot of energy as these neuromorphic computing devices um, can parallelize the system. So let me move on. This is an overview of today's computing elements that are available. So you have a lot of different options when you want to do neural computing. Of course, you can run your neural network on traditional CPU, GPU architectures. I can run any neural network on my laptop. It's just inefficient. We can go to more and more and more specialized hardware for neural networks. For example, Spinnaker, I'll talk about this a bit more in the next slides, is a distributed microcontroller-based system. You have many, many microcontrollers, which each have their local memory and a communication infrastructure so that you can run distributed neural networks, but you can also run any code that you want. It's neurons in software, so you can run arbitrary code. Louis, you heard about from Julia, that's Intel's chip. That is similar, that is a distributed digital system, but there is no more general purpose computation in these special hardware. The hardware itself can only compute what a neuron does. So summing up and firing. It's given in hardware. It's significantly more efficient in terms of energy. Look, it's 15 picojoules versus about 10 or 15 nanojoules per block. It is also more constrained in what can be done. But if you want to run neural networks, this is an architecture you really want to use. There's even more um, closer towards real neurons uh, hardware instantiations. So for example, the brain scales chip developed in an EU project and continued in the human brain project for many, many years is a mixed signal chip. So we have analog computation in the neuron cell bodies. We have um, digital communication between the neurons but it's, it's a much faster system. So here on, on system like brain scales, you could speed up the real-time process by a factor of 100,000 or more so that you can run in these analog uh, electronic settings, you can run significantly faster than uh, normal neural networks. And of course, you can think of customized electronics where you build a dedicated chip for exactly one function. So for example, the stereo matching problem that I talked about earlier, when you want to build a device that help blind people, you can build in stereo matching on events, on spikes in a customized chips. Um, and that will be the least energy efficient and uh, the most 
um, uh, the most specialized version, which does exactly that algorithm, but it's also the most expensive one because every customized design has to be hand produced and has to be uh, created and that costs a lot of money. So this is the an overview of the landscape of uh, neural computing devices. We will look a bit more into Spinnaker because we've used this in the lab for long. And if you want to get your hands on a neural computing system, I suggest that you either use standard GP, CPU, GPU combinations, or you look into Spinnaker or Luihi as these systems are readily available for interested um, academics, so students, um, PhDs, postdocs, and, and on. Um, and they're reasonably easy to use, whereas these mixed signal or even customized analog chips, you need to be an expert on just running them or, or designing them. So Spinnaker, I said this already, is a general purpose computer. It's, it's a network computer so that you can run neural networks on these machines. Let me skip over the details. It's, it's a distributed microcontroller based system that we can run many, many, many neurons. In Manchester, where the Spinnaker system was developed, we have a very large rack of computers. So it scales up you know, from one chip to one board, to one whole rack, to, to one whole cabinet, to, to a whole server room. So they have a system where they have 1 million computing cores that can simulate about 1 billion neurons in real time. So it's a very large neural computer. And if you think back on the first slide that I showed with many, many, many neurons, animals like cats or even bigger and more complex animals, they have much less than 1 billion neurons. So we have the sheer computing power to simulate a cat brain. It's just difficult to instantiate that cat brain so that it can do something meaningful. We don't know how to encode, how to represent the cat brain. Now in my lab at KTH, we also go the very other approach where we build small systems. So that's a standalone Spinnaker chip with a microcontroller for input output communication. So with this one chip, we can run small neural networks, a couple of thousand neurons, probably tens of thousands, where we can feed in spiking signals and we can output spiking signals for motor control. The one project we've done in the past was decoding EEG signals. Uh, we would want to go, you've learned about EEG yesterday, we would want to go to EMG signals because uh, uh, intramuscular recordings from, from an amputee's arm would already be spiking signals. We can use a spiking input signal into a spiking neural network to produce a spiking motor output for neuroprosthetic devices. That's a long-term vision, a long-term dream. We are not quite there yet. But what we do is we have these robotic systems where we have a robotic base, a platform of a robot. We add a neural computing board. So that's a Spinnaker board with 48 uh, chips of 100,000 neurons each. So it's quite a lot of neurons that we can run in this real-time system. We add some interface boards so that we can send in and get out data. We add sensors and we have this complete robot. It's a robot that can drive around, that can perceive, that can see its world and that can produce a motor output. It can produce some behavior in terms of driving. So here you see two examples. At the bottom left, you see a video where this robot observes a pattern on its left and right side. It can compute optic flow from the pattern going by just like bees do, and it can use a simple neural network to center itself along this path. So this, this robot doesn't really understand the world or has any idea of what's really going on. We just configured or trained the network so that the optic flow pattern is balanced on the left side and right side of its driving path. And therefore it drives in the center of the hallway, very similar to how bees uh, learn how to fly without colliding with walls. Next to it, you see a different video of one of my former students uh, using a stereo system. So there are two cameras and, it's, and the student is showing a stimulus that we can move left, right and closer and further away from the robot. And this robot will keep its preferred distance. So it will want that the stimulus is centered in one meter distance. So the neural network on board can produce some behavior by observing the world and producing proper motor output. If we had a physical workshop, if you students were here in Stockholm, 
we would do exactly such experiments in the afternoon session. Now we do something like this in a simulated session in a, in a, in a lab environment, in, in, a, in, a, in a web page where you can train, where you can configure your simulated robot like this. Okay, now we don't want to stay with these wheeled robots. Let me give a very brief, I know I'm running out of time, a very brief outlook on this is what we want to achieve one day. This is how humans walk. I'm utmost impressed. I highly recommend you don't walk like this um, unless you're very good trained, but this is how humans can walk. It's impressive. On the right side, you see how robots walk. It's not quite as impressive. Um, I don't want to put pity on my colleagues in the robots community. And it's very, it's a very, very hard problem. It's very, very difficult. And it's, it's part of the difficulty is because robots are very stiff. And so they're very hard to control. We would like to have compliant robotic systems. We would like to have physically compliant systems. And that's what we have on neuroprosthesis at the bottom. So in the near future, in the midterm future, we would like to have compliant neuroprosthetic devices that we can control. And that's what we want to use neural systems for. So here we have a project where we have a robotic arm that is a compliant, a physically compliant robotic arm. And we have a cerebellum network that is trained, that observes its own motor pattern, its behavior, and that can uh, then learn how to control and drive the robot arm properly. I'll rush through this a bit faster. We can look at that at some time, but we cannot train things by itself. We need way too many iterations. So here is a robotics simulation platform. The um, Human Brain Project Neuro Robotics Platform is a development where we can train simulated robots and then convert the training results into real world systems. We've built some simulated and physical robots. So here, for example, we have on the top right, a virtual robotic mouse. On the bottom left, a real physical robotic mouse that can walk and interact with its environment. There is no onboard computation yet, but we are in the process of putting these, this, the revised version, Spinnaker 2, a significantly more powerful chip on board of one of these walking robots. We could also use a walking dog, a walking, uh, a, a, any other lagged robot that is more complicated to control. The last two or three slides is we have other projects where we have scenes where robotic arms interact with an environment. So here, this is a task that we worked on uh, in the last uh, um, uh, framework of the Human Brain Project, where the robot arm was supposed to pick up objects, explore physical properties of these objects, and then act in the object. So for example, throw. Right now we are working on a different setup where humans and robots should collaborate in a workspace. So here is a place where a human could interact with that robot arm and hand over tools. So the robot could support the human and could help. And we want to do this with these event cameras because they're very fast, very efficient. We want to do this with neural control for the robot because that can work in real time, low energy, on these uh, neuromorphic computers. And here's the, the summary slide for the second part of the talk. So, so we care about real-time neural computation, real-time neural systems, so that we can run algorithms in real time. We don't want to run overnight and then have a perfect neural network. What we want to do is want to connect robots to neural computation. And because the robots work in the real world, that's why we need the robot, the, the networks to work in real time. And the networks have to pro process sensory input and produce motor output in real time. And we don't want to do that for you know, real robots in a student lab. In the end, we want to go to uh, neural prosthetics or devices that help people with disabilities, or we want to go to companion robots. So robots that can help people at home, that can help people to go shopping in a supermarket, or that can be with you as your helper uh, in hospital or in good settings all the time. So it's a societal need that we address through these types of research. That's for the presentation today. Uh, there's much more to be said, but you will get some experience on this combination between neural networks and robots in the afternoon tutorials. And with this, I think I finish for now. And maybe I can take a very small number of questions because I think I'm way over time.